So in this podcast, we're going to talk about our everyday chemicals impacting your thyroid gland. And the simple answer is, it depends. <laughs> there are various factors that are involved. So uh, when you look at chemicals, there are basically two types of chemicals you can classify when you're looking at how it impacts the endocrine system. There are some chemicals that your body can clear out. These are called biotransformable chemicals. So what that means is there's chemicals that you get exposed to, for example, um, pesticides or plastics or bisphenol A's or fire retardants or various chemicals that you may get in your food um, and the water you drink. And if the chemicals can be cleared out through your body's own liver, which they call biotransformation, then um, those are one form of chemicals. There's another form of chemicals that cannot be cleared out of your body. And these are chemicals like heavy metals, mercury, lead, arsenic. And what those chemicals do is they store in your body tissue. And they really have been found to store in two main tissues. They store in body fat tissue, and they actually store in bone. So when we, when we talk about, in this podcast, chemicals that impact the thyroid gland, we're really referring to... Uh, those two categories of chemicals. So let's just first talk about the chemicals that your body cannot biotransform. The liver cannot clear them out. And what that means is these are there's enzymes that we have in our liver that convert chemicals into a, a water soluble state. So we can then eliminate those chemicals through our sweat, through urine, through our feces. That's how we really get rid of these chemicals. The, they get processed through the liver and filtered and then we eliminate them. Um, through those pathways. So chemicals like, for example, mercury, lead, and arsenic, um, cadmium, you know, these so-called heavy metals, we all have some exposure to. And if we get tested, every single one of us is going to have some degree of level. So that's one thing you need to understand. And you really have to be careful of some of these people out there in the healthcare system that will blame everything, every disease process, everything that's wrong with a person based on heavy metals. Because we, we all have some degree of heavy metals, and mummies have heavy metals, and any kind of anthropological studies show that uh, ancient people all had some degree of heavy metals. So there's some degree of heavy metals that are stuck in all of our bodies, and some of us react to them, some of us don't. There's variable things that are involved with it, but there is some degree of load that's a normal part of human physiology. And these chemicals that store in our body, what they've been found to is, first of all, they can store in bone. So lead is notorious for storing in bone. And also when people start to have like osteoporosis, some of these chemicals then uh, reach out through bone loss. And, and it's not uncommon for people like in uh, perimenopause when they're having lots of bone loss, all of a sudden have very, very high levels of lead. It's not necessarily from recent exposure. It's just from their bone breakdown through the osteoporotic period that's now causing these releases into their system. And then there's also studies that found that chemicals store in body fat, and people that have increased body fat seem to have a greater resilience to, to exposure to certain chemicals that it stores in their body fat and it doesn't really impact their endocrine gland as much. So people that have less body fat have less resilient to some of these chemical exposures, so it can it can really store in organ systems before it goes into body fat. So they've actually found body fat having some protective uh, resiliency against toxic load in the conventional toxicology literature. But we all get exposed to some of these heavy metals. If we, if we test for them, we're all going to have some levels. And the question becomes, like, does it actually cause your thyroid to, to be disruptive? And this is where the, the truth is we really don't know. We know that there's research studies that show that chemicals clearly, these heavy metals clearly disrupt thyroid function and hormone function and can trigger autoimmunity to some degree. But there's, there's a lot of things that take place between the chemical exposure and load in our body and then what happens afterwards. So um, just like you can store bone and body fat and uh, bone uh, for some resiliency, one of the key factors is with these chemicals that your body cannot clear out is how your anti-inflammatory oxidative stress systems are. So if a person has lots of inflammation in their body or lots of oxidative stress, they don't have enough antioxidants in their system, um, then these chemicals tend to have a greater impact on, on their system and their health and their physiology. So people that, for example, don't have the buildup of good antioxidants. So let's talk about what builds up antioxidants. So the foods you eat, colorful foods, foods really high in flavonoids, really help 
increase your antioxidant load. Exercise has been shown to increase your antioxidant load. So when you exercise, you actually produce what are called free radicals um, that are basically the inflammatory mediators from physical exercise. But after your exercise, your body surges and turns on antioxidant enzyme pathways where you get lots of antioxidants developed that last for many, many, many hours afterwards. So people that have high amounts of flavonoids and rich colorful food and exercise tend to have a higher antioxidant status than those that don't have those. And people who are exposed to uh, things like gasoline fumes or chemical solvents all the time and deplete their antioxidant levels in combination with diets very, very low in flavonoids and fibers and lack of physical activity can have less antioxidants. So that can be one of the reasons why someone can react to a chemical load um, versus another person. So that's a part of resiliency. So when people develop Hashim hypothyroidism, many of them have Hashimoto's, and that inflammatory response also starts to deplete antioxidants. So we know that just the exposure, just the level alone is not the key factor that impacts this chemical response. We also know there's a whole different phenomenon that takes place with the chemicals that we can't clear out of our body and chemicals that we can, which is how these chemicals bind to our own proteins and change the structure of the protein. And this is a process that's called haptination. So let me talk about that a little bit more. So besides chemicals coming in and causing free radical inflammation patterns and our body's antioxidant systems dealing with that for resiliency, we have an, an immune-related pathway that I want to talk to you about as well. So in the toxicology immunology literature, and this is actually an area where I did my PhD work in, is this process of called haptination. And what happens is you know, when we have chemicals into our body, chemicals can bind to proteins. And the most common protein we have in our blood is a protein called albumin. And albumin is there to control our osmotic pressure, meaning the, the degree of pressure between our blood vessels so we don't have leaky, leaky blood vessels and have uh, healthy amounts of uh, regulation of ions in our blood. But albumin levels, albumin, albumin levels are very high in blood, and chemicals can bind to albumin. And when they bind to albumin, they change the structure of the protein. They change the structure of albumin, for example. And that protein now becomes a new protein, or also known as a neoantigen. And this new antigen can then trigger <laughs> immune responses and be a factor for autoimmunity. So our, we're all having some degree of this new antigen. There's a paper that... Uh, we published in the Journal of Toxicology several years ago where we took 400 healthy blood donor samples. We wanted to see what percentage of the population had this haptination process take place. And we measured, um, I think, about 15 different chemicals like uh, fire retardants, different pesticides, uh, uh, dry cleaning chemicals. Um, and we wanted to see how many of them had these antibody chemical proteins. And it was really about 15 80% of the population we tested has some degree of these chemical reactions that took place. So just because you have these chemical reactions doesn't mean that it causes health problems. So one of the things that determines whether that chemical response takes place is a person's immune tolerance. So if you have immune tolerance, meaning you react or not react to chemicals, that could be a factor of, of how it impacts your health. Now, if you can't handle if you, some, like environmental scents like some perfumes and cosmetics that irritate your skin and you have multiple food sensitivities, that means your tolerance is low and you'd be very prone to this chemical reaction type of view. And if you have a thyroid condition, that can really trigger the underlying cause of hypothyroidism, which is this Hashimoto's response. So again, it's not just the chemical that's, that's the, the factor, but it has to do with how can you store it in tissues like body fat or bone, um, how much antioxidants you have, and then this degree of immune tolerance. And those are really specific for chemicals that your body cannot clear out of. So this is why you could have some people that have very, very high levels of, let's say, mercury or lead on the lab test. They have no illness, and other people have very high levels and they have illness. And again, it's not just the chemical quantity that's a factor, but also how our body has resiliency to deal with, the, deal with these chemicals. Now, that's all with chemicals that our body cannot metabolize out. And then we have chemicals that we can metabolize out. So for example, um, the two most common exposures we get for chemicals are BPA, bisphenol A and plastic products. It's one of the most abundant uh, sources of uh, everyday contamination for all of us because 
all our foods are packed in plastics. People use straws. People use plastic plates. Um, printing receipts have BPA in them. We get exposed to those uh, all the time just by touching them. Um, so we, so when they do studies, when they look at bisphenol A or plastic compound BPA levels in the population, but 90% of the U.S. population, for example, has extremely high levels of BPA. Um, so these chemicals can be metabolized by our liver. So this is a process called hepatic biotransformation, and that takes BPA, that's fat soluble, that, that can't be eliminated by feces, sweat, or urine, and it goes to the liver through two pathways called phase one and phase two, becomes water soluble, and then we can eliminate them. So if some people have healthy biotransformation pathways, and some people don't. And uh, various antioxidants uh, play a role in the clearance of, for example, BPA or other chemicals. And diets really high in sulfur and flavonoids and having healthy antioxidant status, movement, exercise, all improve this biotransformation pathways. There's also a genetic factor. There are people that have gene uniquenesses called polymorphisms that determine how effective they are in clearing certain chemicals. So certain people may be very um, susceptible to clearing out uh, one pesticide versus another pesticide. And that exposure plus their antioxidant status uh, and their genes can be a factor where that chemical may cause a reaction in their system. So a person's detoxification or biotransformation pathways can also be part of the part of the reason why a person may react or not react to chemicals. Now, when you're looking at thyroid function, there are some chemicals that um, really promote the autoimmune disease response <clears throat> through either chemicals that can't be metabolized or unmet that can't be that can or cannot be metabolized. And this is where our pre-existing immune tolerance, our biotransformation pathways, all play a role. So it's important to understand it's not just the level of exposure, but how healthy you are to, to deal with that. And the simple model of just like um, checking for mercury and lead and doing something like chelation therapy has a limited impact in people because a lot of people that, especially those that have Hashimoto's or autoimmunity, they don't have the resiliency. They have significant inflammation. They have blood-brain barrier permeability. They have intestinal permeability. And they have this chemical load. And until those things are addressed, um, they're going to have an exaggerated response to chemicals. So it doesn't necessarily matter what the quantity is. It has to do with their ability to be able to metabolize and have resiliency towards these chemical reactions. Now, um, those things we talk about in a course I have called uh, Hashimoto's Solving the Puzzle. Uh, you can learn more about it at Dr. K News. But um, and in that course, we go into diet, nutrition, lifestyle factors that impact those pathways. Now, let me continue on with other issues with chemicals. So there are some chemicals that are known as goitrogens, and, and these are pretty rare. And there's some medications that, that are known as goitrogens. And what these chemicals do is they bind uh, or compete with the body's ability to take up iodine. And if a chemical has a goitrogenic effect, one of the things that will take place is a person's thyroid gland would actually enlarge. And the other thing that will happen is that their TSH levels will become elevated. What they've really found is that chemical goitrogens are really pretty rare. We're not really getting exposed to those on a daily level, um, unless you're working in a factory with lots of different solvents or you're working in a laboratory working with chemicals, you're probably not getting exposed to goitrogens. But what we're really all getting exposed to are really um, high amounts of pesticides, fire retardants, plastics, and, and those types of um, mechanisms. Now. When it comes to clearing a lot of these chemicals out of our body, uh, you really need to have high amounts of sulfur in your diet. So sulfur, higher sulfur foods, especially the things like garlic and onion and asparagus are really critical for what are called sulfation pathways. That's important for clearing out chemicals. Uh, having high amounts of antioxidants, whether you take antioxidants preventively as a nutraceutical supplement or you eat foods that are rich in color to provide you with flavonoids, that can be another way to build your resiliency. And then at the end of the day, you want to look at ways to reduce your toxic load. So your, reducing your toxic load would be, for example, using glass instead of plastic, uh, not drinking through a coffee lid, making sure the furniture in your house isn't sprayed with fire retardants, making sure your mattress uh, doesn't have uh, uh, chemicals on it. And this is especially important if you are really, really sick. 
So the area of confusion that I think most people have when they think about if they have a thyroid condition, thyroid disease, what role do chemicals play? And in reality, um, it's not just about the amount of chemicals that you have or one specific chemical that causes the condition. It's about the total load and your body's ability to deal with resilience and clear these things out. Because our chemical exposure is ongoing uh, in a modern industrialized world, something that we all have to deal with. But if you don't have the degree of uh, integrity of your biotransformation pathways, the clearance pathways don't have enough antioxidants, and you don't have healthy what's called tolerance, so your immune system doesn't react to chemicals, then it can definitely be a factor that causes persistent inflammatory issues, which could be a problem if you have Hashimoto's or any kind of autoimmune condition that's impacting your thyroid gland. In any case, those are the key things I just wanted to share with you in the podcast and just let you know that at the end of the day, when you're looking at chemicals, you just we just have to remember we're constantly getting exposed. It's just not one chemical. Chemical levels alone aren't the only factors, and these other variables are really where it comes to real-life clinical applications to, to really make a difference to improving uh, health when it comes to chemical exposures. Thank you.